So, uh, as, as um, I just said, I'm, I'm Ian Jones, I'm the CEO at Green Hoodie Earth Station. And uh, if you don't know what Green Hoodie is, um, it's a historic um, satellite communications centre um, in, down in the Lizard Peninsula in Cornwall, uh, not too far away from here. And uh, it started its life back in the 1960s. Uh, when uh, the first transatlantic TV pictures were, uh, <coughs> were, were, were broadcast. So it dates back right from the very beginning of the, the space age. And this is the Telstar satellite that uh, was the, the, the famous, not, not, not quite Sputnik, but uh, it, was, it was launched in 1962 and uh, to carry this first transatlantic TV pictures. And uh, you can see there on the right, uh, that's the uh, Goon Hoodie 1 antenna, uh, which was modelled on the Mark II telescope at Jodrell Bank um, and built by the, the same designers, husband and uh, co from Sheffield. Um, <clears throat> at the time, there was a big debate as to whether you should build a parabolic dish or whether you should build a, a horn, um, a feed horn. And the Americans and the French decided to build a feed horn, and there was this big um, international debate and all the, the tabloids, as they were in the 1960s, um, were, were um, speculating as to which one would work. A anyway, um, I think everyone's agreed now that parabolic dishes are the, are the ones which everybody uses. So. Um, the, the dish in, or the horn in, um, in America has been pulled down and um, the, uh, the one in France is a museum, so there we go. Anyway, um, the history of Goon Hilly really um, was that it belonged to the post office and the post office was the forerunner of British Telecom. So uh, British Telecom and, and the mail, the Royal Mail, used to be amalg amalg amalgamated as one. Uh, being the means of communication, um, and it was a privatised organisation. It belonged to the government, as did most government organisations. So at the beginning of satellite communications era, really NASA had just come into existence in, in the late 50s, and um, the main uh, telecommunications companies of the world were all nationally owned. So organisations like Intelsat, um, when that came into existence, that was set up under the auspices of the United Nations and it had members which were the member states and typically the UK would be the second biggest after America. So typically the Americans would own about 50% and the UK would own about 25% and then various other European countries and Japan uh, would, and Australia um, would, would tend to own a few percent and then there were a few hangers on all the African nations. It, it was a, the thing that, um, it, it was a prestigious thing to have a big antenna in your country. It, it showed that you'd, you'd arrived, so people wanted to build these big antennas. Uh, anyway, um, Goon Hilly was, th was there right at the very beginning of all of these main corporations, Intelsat and Inmarsat and Utilsat, and, and really got involved in, in uh, um, starting those organisations, do, doing the initial tests and making those services work. Um, but really over time then, it's amazing how things go in circles and um, BT then really got into doing fibre and trying to sell everybody broadband connections and started to um, compete with Sky over selling football rights and things and they really felt that the satellite industry was, was um, a sort of sideline for them. And so they earmarked Green Hilly to be destroyed and knocked down. So at that point, um, I and a couple of colleagues started to look at what alternatives there were for, for Green Hilly. And one of the things that we looked at was potential for radio astronomy. But, but really it became clear that we could do different things. So we started to talk to BT around about 2010, 2011, uh, and eventually um, we took over the site. But anyway, just to... Um, sort of talk a little bit about the evolution of spacecraft um, over, over that, that time. 
you can see um, there sort of Telstar pitted against um, actually a, a, a modern satellite. It's, it's a, that's an artist's impression of a satellite. But you can see basically the difference is that Telstar is there with its um, small solar panels. Uh, you know, each solar panel is about this big. And as we know now, because we've got solar panels on the site ourselves, the, the, the power that you get from the solar panel is a raised cosine function. You know, the solar panel only really works well when it's directly pointed towards the sun. And um, so you've got a very small amount of power on your satellite. And that's the only power source is the, the solar panel um, um, picking up power from the sun. So the, the real innovation in satellite communications was when the satellites became gyro-stabilized with internal reaction wheels. So the, the main body of the spacecraft could be pointed directly at, um, at, at uh, the Earth. And then the solar panels, then you've got these big solar panels which could be twisted and pointed towards the sun. And that essentially meant that the satellites became um, hundreds of thousands of times more powerful. And as a result on the ground station, that meant that when Goon Hilly was originally built, we needed these enormous 30 meter antennas. But over time, as the satellites became more powerful, uh, the antennas got smaller and smaller. So the 30 meter antenna you see up here, uh, it was built in 1975. By 1985, we were still building big 30 meter antennas. By 1990, then, the size of the antennas was getting smaller and smaller. And a modern satellite teleport now will operate with the smallest of those antennas. So you can run an entire TV uplink station from the smallest of those antennas that you, you can see up here. And, and that was part of the challenge that BT had, really, that really they had these enormous assets, and what, what were they going to do with them? Uh, and that's, that's when we sort of came up with our business model of, of having this diverse, um, th this diverse activity on the site. So our idea was to use the smallest antennas for the traditional uh, satellite communications, use the bigger antennas for uh, things like tracking and, and telemetry of, of, uh, commercial and, uh, of commercial spacecraft, commercial uh, satellites, and then use the biggest ones for uh, deep space communications and, and radio astronomy. Uh, and that model seems, seems to be working quite well. Uh, and, and I should explain that th th these, these medium-sized dishes that we use for tracking and telemetry um, we could use the small dishes to, to communicate with the, the geostationary satellites. They're, they're powerful enough. But if you're actually controlling the satellite and flying the satellite, if something goes wrong, uh, say one of the reaction wheels fails, uh, then what the satellite does is it goes into emergency sunseek mode. And a satellite can only last for about a couple of hours before its batteries go flat. So what it does is it tries to reset itself and just points itself directly to the sun and puts its solar panels at zero degrees and sunbathes until somebody thinks what to do. And uh, in that case, then, the main antenna is no longer pointing towards the Earth. It's pointing towards the sun. Uh, and so the, the satellites themselves have a, an omnidirectional antenna on board with um, zero dBi of gain. And then you need a very powerful transmitter on the ground to be able to uh, basically command the satellite with its new tasks to, to recover it. So that's why we use these bigger antennas and we have some very powerful amplifiers sitting behind them uh, just in case of emergency. So let me tell you a little bit about our business and our, and our business model and how it all came about. So uh, I first found out that BT were thinking of going to knock down um, Goon Hilly in 2008. And BT being an enormous organization, it took us a while to work out who to speak to, which, which bit. Um, uh, but then, anyway, eventually after pulling a, a group of people together, we approached BT and um, we offered them a deal. Uh, so we completed that in, in the summer of 2009, and then the lawyers got involved. <laughs> so having shook, shook out, shaken hands on, on what, uh, what we wanted to do, 
Um, it then took another two years to uh, get to an agreement. And we signed that agreement in January 2011. And at that point then, um, we had no money, no business. Um, there was no sort of incumbent business on, on, on Goonhilly because BT had sort of closed all that business down. So all we had was a lease of just the antennas because uh, that's all we could afford. Well, that's all my children's inheritance could afford because I was uh, sort of using it to pay for it. Um, anyway, um, we had a three-year option agreement, and that's what that stopwatch is there for. Basically, the clock was ticking for a three-year period that we agreed that we, uh, within that three years, we agreed a price that we were going to buy June 34. And if we could raise enough money, if we could get enough customers uh, within that time period, um, then we could pay BT some money and then own Goon Hilly. So that was the tricky bit. Uh, anyway, we worked with a group of um, universities who, who were very interested in, um, in radio astronomy. And uh, so that, that, that was a real help. Uh, we started picking up commercial business uh, and particularly with SES. Uh, so SES are the world's biggest satellite operator. They are the people who fly the satellites that give you your sky TV. Uh, and we started do doing business. We needed to make a profit so, um, so that uh, an investor would be impressed. Uh, so we had sort of enough business to pay the rent, uh, but not enough business to pay ourselves. So that was a bit tricky, um, but we did it anyway. So we uh, um, just ate water and rice, a bit like being a student again for a while. Um, and, and that enabled us to find ourselves an investor. And with just a few days to spare before the option agreement ran out, uh, we found our investor, got uh, some money, which enabled us to buy the site and to, to invest in growing the company. So that was in January 2014. And then you can see from there, it just started to explode. Almost within days, we had a contract with Planet Labs. So we started hosting uh, an antenna for them. And then all of the other big satellite operators started to want to work with us. And so we built up um, contracts with, with all of the major satellite uh, companies. And then that's led now to um, just last week, in fact, uh, you may have seen in the news, we um, signed a new investment deal for our next round of investment uh, with a billionaire, uh, which is a great way to do it, I have to say, <laughs> because they have very deep pockets and, uh, and uh, are very easy going in terms of what you want to do in terms of a business plan. So our plan now is to, to expand our business internationally. And, and you can see down below, we, we've, in that intervening four years, uh, we've done lots of collaborations, doing, doing lots of things, as well as the, the commercial activities. So we've become an enterprise zone. Uh, we've become, the, uh, in collaboration with Exeter University here, we've become the, the center of excellence in SAT apps with the catapult and, and various other things. So our business growth plan now has, has these sort of six different areas. And I'll talk about the, sort of the top three, really, in, in, in detail. Um, so near space communications is, is our own defined term. It's, it's basically everything in orbit around the Earth um, up to geostationary distance. Um, then deep space communications, is our definition is beyond that. So essentially going cislunar and, um, and out beyond into the, into the solar system. And also it includes radio astronomy as well. And then we have amazing connectivity at Goonhilly, so we're, we're interested in data, data services. Uh, and then because of our background in engineering design, we're also interested not in just being a carrier of other people's services, but actually doing our own design and, and doing communication systems design. Um, and then we're also interested in running our own missions and helping other people run, run missions. So that's, that's essentially what we're doing. So just quickly to zip through these. So the near space communications, really traditionally, it's the, what Goon Hilly has done all of its life is to do commercial satellite communications business to geostationary satellites. 
And so what we've been doing is we've been buying up actually secondhand uh, antennas and, and building them up. So this is a new little antenna farm that we're, we're putting. We're, we're building them sort of concentrated area on one part of the site. It's a huge site, as, as you saw in the first picture, 160 acres. But because the geo dishes um, all just point to one place forever, then you can carefully sort of um, design them so that they can look past each other and you can cram them all in together. And that means then you can see at the, just at the top there, at the back, that's a, a low orbit tracking antenna. Uh, and that means you can spread those out across the site uh, and so they don't ca cause each other line of sight issues. So this is a 3.7 meter uh, tracking antenna that we built along with the catapult. Uh, and that was, that's been used whilst Tim Peake was up in space to do all of his education outreach um, um, uh, work with, with schools across the country. And that, that's going to be, continue to be used by the catapult and space agency for test um, satellites. And then we're also very interested in this change now. There's a huge change that's happening in the, in the satellite, commercial satellite industry, in that um, life is going from um, uh, essentially launching geostationary satellites into launching constellations of low orbiting satellites, you know, very low cost uh, nanosatellites. And that's really incredibly interesting. And, and I've got a party piece, which I didn't bring with me this time. But I, I printed out a, a list of every single space launch ever since 1957. Okay? And it's, it's an, I've got it in an Excel spreadsheet. And if you want it, I'll send you a copy. Uh, it's 150 pages of Excel spreadsheets. And I printed it all fanfold so I could do a party piece. But the, the, <laughs> the, the interesting thing about it is that if you look at the early missions, there's one rocket launch and one payload. You know, the first one is Sputnik. One rocket, one, one payload. And the, the, the very interesting thing, if you look down, it's you know, one rocket, one payload, one rocket, one payload. The Yuri Gagarin's launch into space is at the bottom of the second page. 75% of the launches between Sputnik 1 and Yuri Gagarin's launch failed blew up. And yet he, he still strapped himself on the rocket and went. But anyway, as, as, you, as you go through the pages and pages, what you see is that there's occasionally um, multiple payloads on one rocket. Uh, it happens and there's, there's, there are polar orbiting satellites. But the vast majority of spacecraft that have been sent into space are large mass spacecraft that have been sent into an equatorial orbit. Essentially, you want to go into a geostationary orbit with a big communication satellite, or you might want to do exploration, so you want to be in the, in the equatorial plane, um, or the ecliptic plane, which is quite similar-ish. So you want to launch a big rocket from the equator, so to get the 1,500 kilometers an hour boost going towards the east. But when you get to the end of my 150 pages, there's an absolutely stark change. It's incredible. And it's the rise and the, you know, the next rise of CubeSats. So these are tiny satellites, probably built by universities at the moment or new companies. And the, the, there's no point in launching a CubeSat into an equatorial orbit, because it's only 150 kilometers up. So you won't be able to see it from anywhere apart from the equator. So you have to launch it into a polar orbit. And in that case, um, you know, the name of the game's now changed. It doesn't matter where on Earth you are to launch it, and you need, you're trying to launch a small mass, you're trying to do that frequently. So it's, it's incredible that um, just at this time now, the time is absolutely right for basically a new type of, um, of spaceport, if you like. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting that we have you know, the, the UK's potential spaceport right on our doorstep, uh, which is really interesting at, at Newquay. And the idea is there that you essentially strap a rocket under the wing of a 747, and that goes, takes off on a conventional runway, goes and flies over a, a, a bit of sea that goes north-south, in other words, the Atlantic, launches the rocket, flies back, and refills itself for the, for the next time. So it's a very, very simple way of doing this. And, it, and it's, it's going to absolutely revolutionize 
um, communications and and also getting stuff experiments into space, which is which is really interesting. Um, and Goon Hilly will play a part in, in tracking that. So um, I'm rabbiting, so I shall rabbit quicker. Um, so we're, we're really interested in these big legacy dishes that we had. And part of our, our very initial thought about what we could do with Goon Hilly is um, to use these big dishes. So we're interested in using them, converting them for deep space um, um, uh, deep space antennas, deep space network use, and also for radio astronomy. So the biggest of our dishes, the Goon Hilly 6, is a 32 meter dish. Um, we've pestered and pestered and pestered, and we finally won ourselves an 8.4 million contract to upgrade this dish so it would become part of the ESA S-Track network. So there are two big networks in the world. There's the DSN and there's S-Track. Uh, that have stations in Madrid, California in the case of NASA and Argentina in the case of ESA and then Perth in Australia. And th these deep space networks provide 24-7 tracking of any object going, going out beyond the Earth's orbit. But they're absolutely full to capacity and they cost a fortune to keep and maintain and to, to use if you're a, um, a PI uh, of, a, of a, um, a space probe. So we said, right, let's do the Elon Musk thing. Let's, let's be entrepreneurial and let's create a private deep space network. And so that's what we've we started to do. And we've started the upgrade work um, in the last couple of months. And now, with our new investment, we're planning to essentially do um, find, find other locations, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, so then, not content with just doing the communications part, we're really keen to forge forward in this, this, this entrepreneurial way and actually do our own missions. So we've teamed up with Surrey Satellites, and we have a plan to, uh, to create this mission called Lunar Pathfinder. And the idea is it's a shuttle bus to the moon, and the idea is it will take CubeSats to the moon. So if you design a CubeSat, um, you know, many, many universities do that. Uh, if you get it up into low Earth orbit, that's fantastic. Um, and there's enough power on a CubeSat with the tiny solar panels to give you a communication link back down to the Earth. But if you go out to the lunar distance, then you're um, basically you don't have enough power. So the idea of Lunar Pathfinder is it acts as a relay uh, spacecraft. And this is now, we're finding that this is of great interest to people like NASA and, and the European Space Agency. The European Space Agency have just announced, well, they've just um, awarded a couple of contracts to um, potential um, sort of piggyback riders of, of the Lunar Pathfinder. And, and we're hoping that the next ministerial, they'll get funded so they can become our customers. But essentially what we're looking to do with this system is to create an internet in space. So there'll be a sequence of these spacecraft that go out and a few of them orbiting around the moon, a few around Mars, uh, and then we can be the, the provider of those communication links um, to the big space agencies and the big uh, ex um, rich exploration companies. So the second thing we're doing, we're very involved in radio astronomy. Uh, and we have a whole host of universities that we work with in terms of radio astronomy. So we're converting our second biggest dish, the Goonville 3 there, uh, into uh, actually it's going to be um, a dual use um, um, single dish radio, uh, um, radio telescope and also uh, use for deep space. Um, we've sponsored a PhD student uh, at Oxford University who's built brand new receiver, it's a very wide band receiver, f f um, four to eight and a half gigahertz uh, with a digital back end and that will enable us to do both, that's the subject of his, his PhD. So we're going to be installing that this summer. And then um, finally, coming back to our very original um, uh, antenna Goonhilly 1, Arthur, that was built in 1962, um, the plan with that is to connect that into E. Merlin. So currently, um, E. Merlin, based at Jodrell Bank, has a long baseline between Jodrell and um, Lord's Bridge at Cambridge, 
which is 200 kilometers. And um, that's a sort of, that, that map is twisted a bit, isn't it? So it's a sort of east-west baseline. And so by adding Goonhilly into that, it creates a double uh, length um, baseline in a north-south direction, which means you can steer E-Merlin then to, towards the south and look at southern, more southern hemisphere um, objects that could match up with the SKA. And, and we, we, we've battled a little bit with the commercial world about using and, and engaging with the radio astronomy community in a commercial environment. And, and there, there's this thing that you know, radio astronomy wants to happen in a radio quiet area. And uh, that's, that's why the SKA is being built in South Africa, in, in the desert. But there are, there are real benefits of, of bringing the two together, work, working with a, a commercial earth station. We would never allow the radio, radio uh, astronomy to interfere with us making money because we wouldn't be able to run the business. Uh, but there are things that radio astronomers can do at, at a commercial ground station, uh, testing stuff out uh, and, and getting things working. And, and there are plenty of bits of spectrum where, where they can operate. Um, that, that makes lots of sense from the point of view of having it right on your doorstep. But from our point of view, we see um, radio astronomers as being really clever people who know how to do things. And so one of the things we're looking to do for our global expansion for, for um, deep space is to use the design, this, uh, those of you that know, this isn't the SKA antenna, this is the Meerkat, the predecessor, uh, but it's a very similar design. So this is a 15 meter antenna. And what we're looking to do now is use radio astronomy techniques to create a deep space antenna. So we really need an aperture which is 30, 32 meters. But by putting four 15 meter antennas together and phasing them up, we can create a future proof um, deep space antenna, which has m great, much greater benefits over the current 34 meter antennas because we can sort of use them in, in interferometer mode or we can use them in single dish mode. Uh, you get better character noise performance and all of those things. And they can be used for radio astronomy as well. So we're looking to basically put four of these in uh, California and four in Australia. Very quickly, because I'm definitely running out of time now, um, just, just to touch on, on what Goonhilly has in terms of data connectivity. So Goonhilly was part of the very first internet back in 1977. You can see this was a, this was a picture, not, not my slide, but this was a picture drawn in 77 of the very first internet, connecting the east coast to the west coast of the states, across to Europe via satellite, uh, picked it up at Goonhilly, went into UCL in London, out into, into Europe, and that was the very first internet test, if you like, and it happened at Goonhilly. So now we have incredible connectivity because of the legacy of, of, um, of BT being there for so many years, but also um, we've bought into the Janet network. So we have two separate 100 gigabit per second links into Janet down at Goonhilly, and that connects us to every university in Europe, essentially. So it's a fantastic place for, for doing research. It connects us into the Met Office and all of these, these networks. But also, Cornwall is a very special place in terms of subsea cables. And these subsea cables go all around the world. Literally, the world's backbone of the internet comes into beaches in Cornwall. And one of those lands directly at Goonhilly. And that's the main internet connection between Europe and Asia. So you can see it's, it's one of those lines. Essentially, it comes down Bay of Biscay, through the Mediterranean, down through the Suez Canal, connecting to pretty much every city on the way, it goes into the Middle East, goes into India, goes into Australia, Japan, China. So it's an absolutely amazing connection. But we can connect to all of the other Cornish um, uh, connections. So, so we've got connections to basically, when we connect them all together, it will be the, pretty much the, the, quick, the quickest route to anywhere in the world. And we're, essentially what we're, we're just about to embark on now is to convert one of our, uh, this, this was the old Inmarsat building where all the Inmarsat equipment was and that got sold off. It's now a set of empty rooms that we're now going to create um, an international internet exchange and, and data center there. So 
with that, I'm pretty much out of time. I, I wasn't going to tell you much about uh, engineering design and mission operations anyway. It sort of speaks for itself. We're, we're building up groups. We do loads of edu education outreach work. Um, we do lots of work with um, radio astronomy universities um, uh, across Africa and, and, and then the UK. We're an enterprise zone. Uh, and we, in partnership with Exeter University, we're, we're the regional centre of excellence for satellite applications. And my time is up, so I shall shut up. <laughs>